we're back. Um, and next up on the agenda is Brian Bergamoski from USGS. This is odd. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, as you previously heard, as John said, I'm a biogeochemist at um, the USGS, and I work principally on areas relating to how physical dynamics interact with biogeochemical processes. Um, uh, physical dynamics is not only hydrodynamics, but it is all the other things that affect our physical world. And uh, this is a two-hour talk uh, that I'm going to try to give you in the time uh, that we've got. So um, I actually went and read the charge for the panel so I, uh, to try to make this as related to what you guys are tasked with, which as near as I can tell is to consider all possible futures, consider all possible outcomes from those futures, and then consider all possible responses. So, good luck. Uh, any, any way, anything I can do to help, I'd be happy to try. Um, this, when I went back and I looked at the agenda, um, it looked to me like uh, the lower food web was not well re represented or too well represented in the agenda. So I'm, I'm, I've kind of reframed my talk a little bit so I can cover a lot of the lower food web issues and nutrient dynamics in the system. This was covered very, very briefly in a day-long symposium put on by the the science program uh, about a month ago, but I'm going to just have to skip over the highlights. I, I, I can't develop them all, but it's kind of a trust me talk. If you want more information about anything I show, I'm happy to provide it. But here are the questions that I'm going after. These are directly from the charge for the panel. What are the effects of the altered interior flows on other parts of the ecosystem, such as phytoplankton, zooplankton, and benthos? And um, how do non-flow stressors, such as physical habit and water quality, interact with flows to affect native fish? And then, um, uh, perhaps most importantly, what metrics are most useful to assess, predict, and manage the impacts to fish and the ecosystem? So that's where I'm going with this talk. Um, like I say, I've got to cover a lot of topics. We'll cover, we'll cover a little bit about what John was just talking about, wetland interactions, uh, um, Wetland tidal interactions, advective and dispersive flows, and residence time. We're going to look briefly at phytoplankton and zooplankton, water quality and nutrients, water depth and channel geometry, and we're going to talk about clams. And then I'm going to throw in another wild card here. Uh, you can thank Bruce Herbold for this. This is the issue of drinking water quality because we're not only concerned about fish in this system, we're in concerned about drinking the water. So... The short list, phytoplankton, we're considering them as zooplankton food. We're talking about the nutrients that supply the phytoplankton production, drinking water quality, particularly dissolved organic carbon, but there's also bromide. But what cross-cuts with these issues are the residence time, tidal interaction with wetlands, flow velocity mixing and channel geometry, and interactions with the benthos. So <clears throat> on a talk like this, I feel like it's best to start with my conclusions, so you know where I'm headed. You'll see this slide again. But you've seen a lot about changes to flows, perspective changes to flows. Um, everything you see about the changes to flow affects water and habitat quality. And I submit to you that we don't know enough to predict, project, or model changes in water and habitat quality when we're talking about aquatic pelagic habitat. We're not even quite sure, I would submit, about what we want out there. So I would submit that we need to monitor these changes uh, over the time scales or on the time scales over which they occur, which is the tricky part of this business. So we kind of got into that a uh, decade or so ago with this study on the San Joaquin River. Um, this is well above the reach of the tides on the San Joaquin River up at Crow's Landing, and we were interested in the high-frequency dynamics of nitrate in the system. So this is a plot of nitrate. The white bars are day, dark bars are night, and we collected data every two hours. And what you can see there is uh, that we have a cloud of data that you can't tell much from, and that's because we were collecting data. Even every two hours, we were collecting data too slow. We also, in that uh, back here, um, we had uh, a continuous in situ nitrate analyzer um, that we were running, and you can see that the variations that look like a cloud are actually part of systematic variations in the system. Now, this is pretty important when you're thinking about even prosaic things like loads, because depending on where you choose in this time series, you choose to calculate your daily loads, you can overestimate the daily loads or underestimate the daily loads by uh, 20 or 30 percent. So even in this short period of time, we don't know what the daily loads are unless we have this kind of high-frequency data. But 
That's not really what we're interested in. We're not really interested in calculating loads here. We're looking at the in interested in the fundamentals of the lower food web, and that's what this study was about. We're looking at the, the chlorophyll concentrations changing, changing diurnally, and because we have these high-frequency data, we can decompose the changes in nitrate um, concentration from those that are related to source variability in nitrate. And we published that paper uh, several years ago. So we are concerned about what affects biogeochemical processes, the physical dynamics that affect biogeochemical processes. So we're looking at inflows uh, from the rivers, from the tidal wetlands. We also have to account for groundwater flow, the internal production, internal cycling of carbon. So we have to account for uh, the light hitting the water and uh, penetrating the water. We need to worry about the depth. Uh, you know, the interesting thing about working on these geochemical processes in this kind of system is that it, um, there's simultaneous production transformation and loss. And here's the list of some of the things that affect the rates of those processes. Whether we have, you know, we've got studies that show uh, that barometric pressure change will affect the interactions, flow, water depth, tidal exchange, diurnal cycles, temperature, all, light, Nutrients, all these things affect it. It's, it's very complicated. The interactions are nonlinear, and, and yet we need to understand them. So the talk is structured as a list of things that I think you ought to know. Maybe you've seen some of these things. Maybe you don't. I apologize if you already have, but I just want, I just want to make sure that you know about them for this system. Uh, one thing you need to know is phytoplankton are not all equal. Different phytoplankton support different parts of the food web. Um, and that we want desirable kinds of phytoplankton, and uh, there, uh, we want desirable kinds of zooplankton to feed, feed into the food web, so we want desirable kinds of phytoplankton. These, the, the phytoplankton productivity is affected by residence time, it's affected by clams, and one thing that we really need to keep um, on the table for the future is that phytoplankton and wetlands compete for nutrients in the system. So here's an example. This is a, a slide that was given to me by Alex Parker, who's done a lot of work uh, with uh, uh, Dick Dugdale and, and Francis Wilkerson on this in the area um, that shows uh, the taxonomic distribution and abundance of phytoplankton across the delta in this study. And the different colors in these pie charts represent the different taxonomic groups of the phytoplankton. And what I want you to see here is that it's different. And these differences are related to the habitat properties that uh, gave rise to these populations. So nutrients are needed for phytoplankton production. Nutrients are needed for wetland production. Too many nutrients lead to eutrophication, harmful algal blooms, and dissolved oxygen problems, and we certainly saw that down in Stockton. But too few nutrients lead to fewer nitro, uh, phytoplankton. So if we're looking about uh, managing the pelagic environment, we need to worry about nutrients, light, and productive conditions in the pelagic environment, or the sweeping of that, that phytoplankton productivity from the lateral shallow water environments into the pelagic environment. I'm sure you all have seen this paper by Glibert. Um, she uh, has uh, put on the table that we should think about not only nutrient concentrations, but nutrient ratios. Uh, and, and she suggested there's been regime changes in nutrients. We, she's uh, here in our estuary, but we've seen this sort of thing in other estuaries as well, where they're high nitrate and high phosphate favors one kind of phytoplankton, which favors one kind of zooplankton, and that in turn favors uh, certain populations of fish. Um, in the mid-'80s, we switched to uh, more high ammonium, high phosphate. Uh, we changed the mix of phytoplankton, which changed the mix of zooplankton, which changed the mix of fish. And now we're living in a low phosphate, high ammonium environment, the ammonium coming from the wastewater uh, treatment plant. We are ten that tends to form smaller cells, changes the, the kinds of uh, zooplankton in there, and uh, has different effects on the fish. So we change the energetics by changing the nutrient ratios. This is somewhat controversial in our story. There's um, the phytoplankton biologists are still sussing this out, but it, it is on the table as a hypothesis. Here's some data to support that, uh, also given to me by Alex Parker. Um, here's nitrate uptake. So one of the forms of nutrients that we're looking at um, is very well correlated with diatom. Uh, biomass, which is one of the good players in the phytoplankton field, or ammonium uptake is correlated with uh, cyanobacteria biomass, um, and this is some of the bad players in the field, and, and uh, the, some of the harmful algal bloom critters live are, uh, are taxonomically cyanobacteria. 
Now, here's the problem in our system, is that our system is incredibly dynamic. So John showed you some data from Walnut Grove. Uh, this is a sensor we have deployed in conjunction with John's flow station in Walnut Grove, and it shows the three principal uh, nutrient sources, so ammonium, nitrate, and phosphate. So here's the ammonium. So this is the putative bad player in our system that is uh, reshaping the food web. So we're looking, uh, you know, this is from a couple weeks ago only. Uh, what is that? A little bit more than a week of data. We see lots of high frequency variability and then this trend here where the ammonium concentration declines. Uh, nitrate in dark blue um, here comes down about to the second, uh, about uh, doubles in concentration. So that, I mean, the ammonium has gone down by a factor of 10. The nitrate has gone up by a factor of two. The phosphate takes an initial plunge and then rises. So we have had not only um, wide variations over this short span in the concentrations themselves, but we've had wide variations in the concentration ratios, the putative driver of the fundamentals of the food web. So <clears throat> um, I grabbed uh, the... Uh, the data from, this is the flux data from Freeport, so you can see a little bit about what's driving this variability. So this is the tidally filtered flux data, uh, discharge data from Freeport, um, and we got a bump in the discharge uh, uh, along about this time. There's about two days of transit time, to one to two days of transit time down to Walnut Grove. So you can see this is a flow-driven process that's changed concentrations and ratios. Space, I mean, spatial variability is also an important thing that we have to consider in this system. This is a map of, uh, this is the Cache Slough Complex, uh, Liberty Island here, and uh, we, this is a map of the surface nitrate values around this system. Um, we have very high values in this dark blue, low or near zero values in this yellow color. And there, there's a couple of things that... Uh, that are apparent from this slide. One is that these longer resonance time areas um, in, in these channels can have the nitrate completely removed through denitrification, through uh, uptake, or other processes. So you can nutrient starve some parts of this system through long resonance times. You can also uh, form nutrient traps, such as this dead end slew up here, where you get nutrient trapped over the years and then regenerated and it continues to trap. So you can get very high levels of nutrients in some parts of the system. And then uh, this is the lower, this is Sacramento River and the lower Cache Soup Complex. And the Sacramento River is actually during this period, not during all periods, but during this period, supplying uh, nitrate and other nutrients to the the um, Liberty Island wetland, and the Liberty Island wetland is one of these shallow water environments that is the kind of thing that we think we want to create in this system. So John talked to you a little bit about wetland, wetland interactions. This is something that my group dives pretty deeply into. The interactions with the marsh surfaces drives a lot of fundamental geochemistry and biogeochemistry that we need to understand better. Uh, the highlight items I want you to know about is they can be sources or sinks of nutrients. They can be both sources. Of, they can be sources or sinks of phytoplankton and zooplankton. Peggy Lehman's got a nice paper out on that. And they can switch from being a source to a sink rapidly and unpredictably. Just to get, put a little data behind that, this, uh, you know, one of those hydrodynamicists' famous squiggly line plots. In this case, this is nitrate concentration going up and down tidally. Over a period of time, this is on Liberty Island. So we're at the mouth of Liberty Island, and we're watching the flux. John's got a flow station there. We've got a continuous uh, nitrate uh, monitor there, and so we can explicitly calculate flux in these tidal environments. Um, so you can see the concentration change, uh, 30 to 40 percent tidally here. When we calculate the uh, flux during this period, it's about 200 kilograms per day. Sign convention is positive seaward, so this is an export flux of about 200 kilograms per day. When we look at um, during this period, we see very different interactions in terms of the concentrations. We see a negative flux, so during this period, the island is actually importing a tremendous amount of nitrate, and that's the fuel uh, bloom that was occurring during this period. So, I don't know, my slides got a little bit messed up, but we'll keep going here. 
So I'm going to dive in a little bit about drinking water just because, like, like I said, I think you, you, you need to keep this in mind. Dissolved organic carbon, if you don't know, is problematic in drinking water treatment. Um, and chlorination and ozonation, um, particularly in highly brominated systems such as ours, it forms carcinogens and teratogens, which are regulated by the EPA. And uh, the costs for treating that kind of water tend to be enormous, uh, both infrastructural and ongoing costs. The dissolved organic carbon doubles in, uh, in concentration in transit across the delta. So there's a lot of internal sources. The sources internal to the delta are the wetlands. Even though we only have a few postage stamp size wetlands in the delta, uh, they, we all show you uh, what we've found from some molecular fingerprinting work. And uh, the other source, major source, is the island drains, the, the agricultural drainage water from the islands the polders to keep them from uh, going underwater. It has a lot of carbon associated with it as well. So what you need to understand and when you're putting this into a flow frame is that higher residence times will allow more of the internal stuff to accumulate and will increase the amount of carbon in the delta. So it kind of it, it, it decreases the treatability. Now, I'm not sure if uh, anybody's mentioned this to you, but the other concern about from the drinking water trans. Uh, the drinking water treatment side is that the salt trapping that tidal wetlands uh, that happens when you have tidal weapons, they will, they will preferentially trap the flood tide waters because of the ebb flood hysteresis, and you tend to have um, a landward migration of salt in these systems, and if it's got even the slightest amount of bromide, that, that reduces the treatability significantly. So if we do large-scale tidal restorations in the center part or, or the southern parts of the delta, that's something we need to monitor for and watch out for. So this is the data um, I was talking about. Um, how am I doing on time, Sam? You've got uh, at least 10 minutes. Yeah. Must be talking fast. Um, so we've got uh, four sources. We did a chemical, chemical fingerprinting model where we looked at the relative dissolved organic carb uh, con carbon contributions to export, a similar, uh, simple linear mixing model um, using a uh, variety of molecular and isotopic tracers. Very interesting paper, I think. Um, most of the carbon comes from the river. It increases in concentration, like I said, about 50%. During some periods, the island drains appear to be the most significant source of the carbon that is increasing the total concentration during transit. Um, during other periods, 40% of the increase, 40% um, of the total concentration is from these the little remnant wetlands that we have within the delta. So if we expand those, Anywhere in the system, we have to be concerned about how it affects drinking water treatability. Another issue is that the wetlands themselves produce a particular kind of carbon that is more problematic with respect to treatment. They form more of these dis disinfection byproducts. Uh, the most abundant disinfection byproduct is, are the trihalomethanes, um, and the wetlands form 40% more of them. So it's not only the amount that it contributes, but the kind of carbon it contributes. So we also need to be concerned about the issues of channel geometry. Um, this is uh, a figure I got from Lisa Lucas. Uh, so the the model for phytoplankton production that we're considering in these systems for improvements to the pelagic environment is that <clears throat> uh, shallow water um, exposes an individual phytoplankton to more light because the overturn in shallow water uh, pushes the phytoplankton up into the photic zone more frequently. Deeper water, less so. So you get more production in shallow water, uh, less production in deep water. Uh, according to this kind of simple modeling scenario. However, uh, and, and this is why we're thinking about the, uh, trying to build the system in, in ways that produce a phytoplankton subsidy in the, in the shallow parts of the delta and then advect it tidally into the deeper parts because we want to take advantage of this. But life isn't that simple, as Lisa points out. And what kind of... Uh, what, what, uh, disturbs the simple model uh, mainly is clams. So in the, the situation is inverted when you consider the effects of clams because in shallow water environments, the same mixing that makes the phytoplankton 
more productive actually uh, exposes the phytoplankton to predation more often. So they see the benthos more often. Um, they get uh, filter feeder clams, graze them more. During, in the deeper environments, the effect of grand, the clam grazing pressure is less. So when we consider about what kinds of environments we want to build or what kinds of environments are out there naturally, we need to consider together the effects of production and degradation. We need a more complete modeling and understanding of the way this system works. So in conclusion, I think you've seen this before, you know, all these things change and they change in, in all sorts of different ways when you change the flow field. Um, and if you guys are already modeling all this stuff and you haven't told me, I, I'm going to be very mad because I, this stuff just seems like it, uh, it defies modeling because of the, the multitude of interactions from the fine-scale turbulence to the gross-scale flow to the... Um, to the weather, to the light field, to everything. It's, it all combines in, in interesting ways. So what we suggest is that you need to monitor the changes if you want to have some sort of adaptive management program. You need to monitor them on the time scales over which they occur. So the good news is there's been kind of a revolution in uh, water uh, quality, water and habitat field instrumentation, and we can build uh, at, a, at an affordable price, um, these observatories in, our, in these systems so we can understand things uh, in dynamic environments. And what we suggest is that you need a network of habitat indicator monitors that looks quite a bit like the John's Flow network out there. So they, they, they need to be located within a flow network so you can do the appropriate modeling, um, and they need to be located within a tidal distance of one another. But there, we also need to expand our definition of what it is we're monitoring. So we're no longer monitoring water quality in the classic sense. We need to actually uh, think a little bit more clearly, look at the capabilities of the new um, devices that we have to put on these monitoring stations, and think about what we're trying to create. So we can, you, we can develop stations that uh, give us information about phytoplankton by looking at pigment concentrations, but not only chlorophyll, but looking at all the accessory pigments. We can do basic phytoplankton taxonomy on the fly, so we have a continuous idea of how the taxonomy varies. And then we can look at biogeochemical variables such as dissolves oxygen, CO2, pH, nutrients, and light, so we can use simple biogeochemical models to test how well the system is doing uh, with respect to theoretical uh, possibilities or theoretic, th theoretical energetic expenditures. We can also take more interesting data with respect to the pelagic fish habitat. We can do on-the-fly calculations to calculate what the visual range is, the perceptive distances for fish of different types, which uh, affects their habitat selection. And we can look at the visual range, but not only the range, they need a certain contrast. Uh, color contrast is important for uh, perception of prey. Uh, temperature profile, particle size distribution are also important. And then we can do continuous water quality. These days we can even do dissolved organic carbon uh, on the fly. But we all, the sediment should also be on this list as well. So these are now possible. I, I don't, you know, if we're going to understand this system and manage this system, I don't see the way around trying to put the, some, some network like this out. That's all I got. Okay, we have time for a few questions. Difficult to tell if these mics are on or not. So, so um, you said a couple of things to me that um, don't seem to mesh together, and it and uh, and it relates to modeling versus monitoring. And I want to I want to make sure I, I I understand that part right. So, you're saying this is way too complicated to model but you can monitor it and understand what's going on. Did I, did I misinterpret that? Or? Well, I, I uh, may have expressed myself wrong. Uh, the, I would submit that you need this kind of monitoring data to develop appropriate models for understanding the system. So this monitoring alone will not give you the answer. 
you need to put it in the context of flow and flow models, biogeochemical models, and others. But, uh, you know, for our simple models, as I showed, of just determining load, our load calculations, the model for taking uh, discharge times concentration, that model is demonstrably wrong. So we need to improve that model by using higher frequency data. That, I mean, that's the point, is you need to use these things together. Until, I mean, until now, uh, we've had a low frequency data, so we have a, we have a distorted understanding of the system. And, and many of the variables you were putting forth to monitor, none, none look to be rates. They all look to be standing stock kind of variables, DO, pH, chlorophyll. It, was that just a partial list, or do you see a role for process-type studies, which you know, most of the models we deal with um, deal with rates? And do, can that be done within the context of what you were suggesting, or is that more special studies that, for example, the low salinity zone study that was recently done uh, by Kimmerer et al. and stuff, where it was a very – I'm trying to make a distinction between uh, – Process studies and monitoring, and, and maybe I'm not, I'm not uh, making myself clear, but I, that looked to be monitoring. Um, well, I, I would Can you just comment on that. It, yeah, sure. I would submit that I there never is, ended with a question. I so. would, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I would submit that there is no distinction. I, I would submit that that's a, an artificial distinction. That I mean, what, I, what why you're collecting these biogeochemically important variables is so you can understand the rates that drive. I mean, you just don't get to measure those rates in these simple ways. You, you need to use more, more intensive techniques to measure the rates. And you measure the rates uh, uh, through more specialized studies, much more specialized work needs to be done to implement this at the large scale, but then you use the monitored uh, parameter values as inputs to models that operate uh, with a time step and a flow step that's appropriate for the system. So you definitely need the modeling element to it to extract the rates. With this data, and we're in the process of doing that, you can develop those rates, the rates of productivity or the rates of loss, and test them against the, the kind of more point-based understanding we have currently because, with these more sophisticated models to see if we, where our knowledge gaps are. I'm just uh, curious, you didn't mention light, but it's my understanding that primary production in this estuary is light limited. Uh, well, I, I did, well, uh, I didn't highlight light, and I, I can, I mean, light is one of the biogeochemical variables that is on the list and needs to be on the list and needs to be part of the biogeochemical modeling. Um, one of the things, I, one of the areas I think we have uh, uh, difficulty right now in the delta and estuary is is converting uh, incident radiation, uh, phytoplankton abundance, uh, nutrients uh, through simple biogeochemical models into standing stocks of chlorophyll that we rely on a, a, in a monitoring framework to understand the system. We need to improve uh, our characterization of the light field, and our, we're actively doing that where we're, and we need better monitoring of it to improve those models. It's definitely part of the equation. Okay. Are you going to be around for later on, too? Sure. Okay. Well, we're going to shift gears a little bit and look at another um, aspect of habitat in the Delta. And 